everybody, this is Ian O'Byrne. We're diving back into our series of videos about uh, the Web Literacy Initiative and figuring out what impact this has on teaching and learning with technology. In Module 3, we're looking at the second of our cornerstones of the Web Literacy work, and that's uh, reading, or as I've been framing it, online reading comprehension. Let's dig into it a little bit more. So if we think about what online reading comprehension uh, could be, in my previous research and, and studying online reading comprehension, we viewed online reading as questioning, locating, evaluating, synthesizing, and communicating. Um, but really what we're looking at is having students search and sift through multimodal informational text, the kind of information that we find on the internet um, and that we may be able to use in our classroom, but we know that our students, that individuals are using this uh, already openly online. So as we've started in some of the other discussions, we're in this em enormous transition right now. We're thinking about our own literacy practices, the ways in which we read, write, communicate, the ways in which we teach and learn and socialize with others, and trying to figure out what impact does the internet and other communication technologies have on the work that we do, the ways that we learn, the ways that we process our learning, and the ultimate product or output of our learning. When we think about reading comprehension, one of the challenges is that we often have very traditional views on what is reading, you know, what counts as reading and what does not. Do, you know, do we think that audiobooks count as reading? Um, do, uh, you know, books, should books be print on paper? You know, do uh, we have individuals that, as I said in the previous module, we have individuals that need to be able to see and smell a book in order to have it count as traditional reading. Um, so the, the challenge that we often have is that we, many of us, have very traditional views on reading. And for the most part, reading is print on paper. Uh, and there is this belief that reading is a very individual act, that we go to the text and we make sense of the text. And a lot of reading comprehension happens with decisions and interactions and framing of the text that we make in our own minds. The challenge is when we move to digital text and we move to reading, um, you know, we, I often say that the internet is the dominant text of our generation. So the challenge is often when we move to the, the internet as a text, as a form, as a place for reading and writing and communicating, one of the challenges is that we are often reading across multiple spaces using multiple devices. Yes, this still means that reading a book or reading a magazine or a comic book still counts as reading. Uh, we're not getting rid of the books, but we also add in a lot of these other digital texts and tools that we could read and use for reading. So it might be listening to an audio book or listening to a podcast. It might be viewing a YouTube video, um, but we're looking at reading using tablets, mobile devices, laptops, and other devices. You know, we're, we're starting to see wearables enter the, the, these different spaces. So we have to think about what happens to the process of reading as we open it up to these multiple devices. As I said before, we're also thinking about reading as a process across multimodal sources. And what I mean by multi, multimodal sources is that we're looking at reading across text, image, audio, hyperlinks. Um, so we could have reading that occurs within that audiobook. We could have reading that occurs as students, as individuals, you know, read a YouTube video. Um, and so we're bringing in much more of a visual element to reading as opposed to just text on printed paper. So this also causes some challenges. So the, the, the thing that we'll have to think about later is how do we synthesize reading across multiple sources, across multiple multimodal sources? We also have to think about how do we make sense of where we are as we move across these spaces and what do these other elements include? Uh, how do these impact our reading? So what does it mean when we have a, a Wikipedia page and we are reading along next to a newspaper article and we're reading next to a YouTube video? What do all of these different things do and how do they impact what we ultimately learn and what we ultimately read? 
Also, as we said before, many of us view reading as a solitary act. We, in our classes, get PDFs that we read. We have books that we take out from the library. When we work with others or work with students, we give them the text. And for the most part, they get their own meaning and they construct their own meaning from what they read in the text. The challenge is when we open this up to a, a digital space and also when we open this up to a one-to-one -one laptop classroom, part of the challenge is that we are having children read across multiple spaces all at the same time. So earlier we would like to, you know, a teacher could say, okay, turn to page three, turn to the second paragraph on page three, put your finger there, okay, let's all start reading. And you knew that if a student in the classroom read that sentence that appears at that spot where you direct them, you know that they're reading all the same thing all at the same time. So if there's an issue that they're sort of disconnected or they don't get it, you just go right back to that, that line that you indicate. The problem is that doesn't really happen on the internet. We should, we don't really bring children to one page on the internet and say, okay, everybody start here. Everybody start on this web page what real reading online looks like, what online reading comprehension really looks like, is you start with an internet inquiry project. You start with one subject that you want them to research. You bring them to the search engine, or many teachers have the, the individuals choose their own search engine, but you basically bring them to the beginning of the internet and say, I want you to learn about X. Now go ahead and search for it. And even if you bring them to the search engine results, there's challenges as based upon where we click and what we read and what we don't click on and what we don't read, we could all learn different things. So in the earlier situation, you could say, okay, turn to a certain page, go to a certain paragraph, read this sentence, and we would all learn the same thing. When we go on the internet, for the most part, we could all learn completely different things because we're going to go to different pages. We're going to read and ignore different things on different pages. And so this really impacts teaching and learning. This impacts our, our pedagogical choices. So the thing that we're going to think about throughout this module, and it's something that we do in all of our modules, but what impact does this have on teaching and learning? What impact does it have to have on us when we don't have that opportunity to really guide learners or scaffold learners? We still do have opportunities to guide and scaffold them, but we have decisions to make about how much freedom and latitude we give our children, how much freedom and latitude we give our learners as they go on and interact in these spaces. So we have real decisions to make about what happens when we sort of open up these boundaries for a literacy practice, most notably reading. One of uh, the, the literacy practices that really impacts the future of teaching and learning. So if we look at the web literacy map, this is the earlier version. I like to start here, but typically what we'll look at is exploring is navigating or reading as what we're focused on now. Building is the creation or the online content construction or writing and then connecting. We've already talked about, which is participating uh, and connecting with others and socializing. So if we're firmly nestled right now in exploring and navigating in our examination of reading, what we're looking at is some of the initial parts we already do. So we focus on navigation and how to get in and use different browsers, get in and use different tools and negotiate these environments so that we can learn so that our students can find new information and read and understand. We also think about basic web mechanics, an understanding of how the internet works, an understanding of uh, hyperlinks and making sense of hyperlinks and how the the internet and the web is connected together and what impact this has on the work that we do we also have to be understand we have to be cognizant of search and the role of search and the opportunities that search provides us but then also the limitations that search places on what we learn we also have to think about credibility of informational sources, and we'll talk a lot about that. And then once again, we see security coming in here because as we go openly online, as we search and learn and interact with others, we have to be uh, cognizant. Once again, we have to be aware of the security issues that we may have as our learners get out there online and they explore or they navigate or they read online. 
So once again, if we look at the newer version of the Web Literacy Initiative, we've taken a look at participation already. We'll get into writing. But with reading, we're looking at exploring. We're looking at online reading comprehension. So if we're looking at reading, we're taking a look at evaluation, synthesis, navigation, and search. All of these are challenging issues, challenging elements to fold into our classroom. What I want to do is I want to focus on online reading comprehension and focus on the ways in which we framed it in the past. So the way that we looked at reading previously in my work in online reading comprehension is we boiled it down to questioning, locating, evaluating, synthesizing, and communicating. A lot of times now in, in my recent work we look at communication as moving over into the writing side, but we'll still include it here just so that we're aware of the opportunity or the need to take lessons learned from informational tasks and then bring them over to uh, or communicate them to others. So once again we're focusing on reading, we're focusing on online reading comprehension and what impact this has on our work with uh, learners in, in online and hybrid classrooms. As we get started, I want to reiterate a lot of the pieces that we had before, that the internet is this generation's defining tech for literacy and learning. So the internet is the, this generation's dominant text for literacy and learning. We also believe, I believe, that new literacies and these digital texts and tools are central to civic, economic, personal participation in a globalized community. And so it is the responsibility of all individuals to bring this learning to all learners. We can't say that one school, you know, the, the learners there, the students there can have access to this. We can't say that this belongs only in one classroom. So this is a lot of the reason why in my own work, I view this, yeah, I view instruction using digital text and tools. I view these new literacies or digital literacies or web literacies as the role of all educators because all students need to have this for future success in civic, economic, personal participation in this globalized community. The other thing that we need to be aware of is that these skills and these dispositions and these, these knowledge sets are always going to change. So even as I record this video and even as I make sense of this and, and make it available and accessible for all of you, we have to recognize the fact that all of this is all changing. It's changing all the time. It's not going to stop. I view this as a benefit. I think that that's incredible. I think there's always opportunities to think of new habits, new perspectives, new knowledge, new opportunities. Um, but for some of us, we view that as a, a negative that there's no, uh, it, there's no ceasing to the change here. The only constant that we see in this is change. Okay, so that's something to be aware of. This is always in a state of flux. The other thing that I am aware of in my work, and I want all of you to be aware of, is that this work, these new literacies, these web literacies, require new strategies, skills, dispositions, and social practices. So there are things that we can learn from traditional reading and writing. Some of those things will carry over to these new digital spaces. We also need to be aware that some of these things will not. Uh, some of these skill sets require new social practices, so new thoughts about new parts, you know, new opportunities for collaboration and new opportunities for participation. All of this is to say that we need to constantly think about and problematize our own thoughts about teaching and learning and what this means for our classroom. Also, when we think about the Internet as the text, one thing that we need to keep in mind is that our students are constantly inundated with digital media. Uh, there are several reports online that suggest that our students consume about eight and a half hours of digital media per day, and they multitask when they do this. And a lot of the research by Pew Internet, uh, by the Pew Research Center, also the Kaiser Family Foundation, finds that our students, when they're not in school, for the most part, they are actively consuming this information online. And when they're in school, they don't have these opportunities to interact with and search and sift through online texts. So the, the challenge is that they're already consuming this. They're already doing this. But when they come in their, our classrooms, they're not. Um, when we do have the Internet, these digital texts and tools in our classrooms, 
we have the opportunity, we have an opportunity to expand boundaries of literacy and bound the expand, expand the boundaries of our classroom. So we can open up the walls of our classroom. This provides, with, provides us with a lot of opportunity to extend learning and bring our students out to different forms of information. It's also a challenge because we have to worry about all of the other things, such as what I talked about before, where it's not possible to say, okay, turn to this page and this sentence on this page, let's all read together. Or, you know, when we get lost in a textbook, we tell our students, go find the bold-faced words that are on the page and, and go to the index at the back of the book. There's no real bold-faced words on the internet. There's no real index to the internet or a glossary to send students to if they get stuck. So we have to teach them skills to help them out if they get lost along the way. Because you will not always be there to support them if they get stuck as they're learning online, especially after they've left your classroom. Uh, we also notice that we note that, as I said before, their futures depend on their ability to use these internet technologies. We can't put them out into the career or workforce without building up this skill set. We're not helping them. We're not preparing for them for their eventual futures. And then also, use of the internet transforms instructional practices. Once again, this is what I left off on the last slide, but I think that we need to problematize our thoughts about pedagogy, about teaching and learning, problematize our thinking about text and these literacy practices to figure out, okay, what's changing and what do my students really need for their futures? So once again, if we bring it back to online reading comprehension, in my work in the past, in online reading comprehension, we defined it as questioning, locating, evaluating, synthesizing, communicating. Each one of these is terribly important in and of itself. I'm going to walk us through these different elements to make sense of what this all means. One thing to keep in mind when you teach online reading comprehension, when you teach reading, as a web literacy in your classroom, there are other elements that you can also focus on. You also need to keep in mind that you don't need to focus on everything. So you don't, you, you should not go into a lesson and think about, okay, I need to have them question, locate, evaluate, synthesize. You might be able to focus on one thing. You might be able to spend a week. You might be able to spend a unit plan or an entire year on evaluation. And that'll be a powerful year for you and for your students. So you don't need to feel like I have to cover everything. Um, in fact, it's probably a better idea not to try to cover everything. So if we take a look at questioning, questioning is one of the initial steps. Questioning is all about do the students, it's, can students restate questions in their own words? So if you ask them, uh, you know, a, a question, if you give them a, a piece of inquiry, can they take it, think about it, and restate it in their own words, make sense of it in their own words? Um, do they really understand what you're asking them to do? Also, for a necessary skill set to use the internet for searching is can they think about a question and can they formulate keywords from this question? So can they think about your query? Can they think about your inquiry and make sense of it, but then also say, okay, what are four or five keywords that I need to be able to go find more information about this? This is a very valid, uh, valuable skill that they'll need for their futures. Many of us, the way that we've learned how to search and the way that we've learned how to Google is through trial and error. And the other thing is that the, the search engines that we've grown up and we've become accustomed to, they have been changing over time as well. So the designers, the developers, the programmers, the coders, they've recognized that as human beings, we have uh, challenges with finding keywords and we've learned in the past about boolean search terms and all of these other pieces and they realize that we're not good at that so they've modified the search engines over time to help us um, to make the the interface a little bit smarter because we can't negotiate that space and then another piece of information that's very important for questioning is there is a, a metacognitive practice where students need to to figure out okay when have I answered all of the, the, the question? You know, as, as we're searching online, there's always the problem with, do I have everything that I need and I can proceed? So we see this in our classrooms already. We see students ask, you know, if, if a paper is done or if they've answered all of the question. Well, this is a skill that we definitely need as we move into these digital spaces 
and we have to think about opportunities to build this up in our students. So you need to be able to go online, search and sift, figure out if you have all of the information you need to, if I, to answer the question, and if you don't, you need to be able to backtrack and go back and find more information that will help you out. The second step of this is locating. As I said before, each one of these is important in and of itself. Locating is locating search, uh, locating information both within a search engine, but then also locating information on a web page or a website. So one of the first things we do is we have students look at different search engines. So they might use Google or Bing or other services that are out there. Use different search engines. See what results you get from the different search engines. See how they present the information in different manners to make it easier for you or more difficult for you. See how they can personalize search engine results to make your job a little bit easier. But then as soon as we get into the results for search engines, one of the locating strategies that we often look at is, okay, what do I do with the information the search engine gives me? Where do I click? How can I read search engine results to see what's the important information and what's not? So a lot of our students, what they will do, what many individuals do, what we do, is we Google something and we click on the first link. And if it doesn't make any sense, then we back out and we click on the second link. Now, if that doesn't make any sense, we click, we back in and out. Um, so this is known as a click and look strategy. So we sort of hop in and out of web pages to see what makes sense and what doesn't to us. Um, this can be problematic. You're basically trusting the search engine. You're trusting algorithms to, to you know, synthesize the research or synthesize the information for you. The other thing that we need to be aware of is that Google and these other companies know that we're doing this and so what they're doing is they're putting sponsor links and ads up top and there's also companies that sort of game the system to put information up top so that we are clicking on stuff that there's a fiduciary or a monetary reason why that stuff is up there students also in terms of location know how to use internal search engines so if there's a website there's a search engine within the website locating also has uh, how do we find information on a web page? So if you're looking at a long page of information, how do I know where to look to get the information? Um, a lot of students, I was taught in the past by a middle school student how to basically click on Control F on a, on a computer to quickly look for a keyword on a page so they knew where to read. Because some of our students, some of us, if there's a lot of information on a page, we sometimes get lost. Then one of the last real important pieces here for locating is we need to know how to ignore information that we don't need to think about. So a lot of locating is searching and sifting, making sense about what's good and what's not good. But then also we need to teach our students that it's okay and there's opportunities to, and we need to sometimes ignore information. There's stuff that we don't need to pay attention to. And it's really um, a distractor. Um, and so we have to think about not only how do we provide opportunities for our students to search and sift online text, but then also how do we provide opportunities for them to ignore things in our classroom and that it's okay at times to ignore what we're reading or what we're learning about or ignore us perhaps. Um, when do we do this in teaching and learning? When do we think this is appropriate in our classroom? Because this is a skill that they will need as they interact in these digital spaces. Evaluation is very near and dear to me. I focused on it in my dissertation. I focused on critical evaluation of online information and there's numerous reasons why. One of the key elements is that uh, readers need to monitor what they're reading and they need to monitor as they read to figure out whether or not this information meets their needs. So they're thinking about credibility and relevance. And in my, in my research, when I was working with students, I would use these terms about credibility and relevance, but for many middle school students, for many students in K-12, credibility and relevance don't mean anything. Uh, and so to help them think about it, when I talk about credibility and relevance, for the, the credibility piece, we use the word truthful, and for relevance, we use the term useful. So we looked a lot about 
whether the information was useful and, and whether it was truthful. So the truthful part is, is it believable? Is it credible? Is it something that I can look at and on its face value I can believe? Can I believe the author? Uh, is the author an authority on that subject? Do they know what they're talking about? Um, then the usefulness, do I need this for my search? Do I need this to help my needs and the, and the reason why I'm reading online right now? So with this look at credibility and relevance, at this look at truthfulness and youthfulness, what we're thinking about is, does this information meet my needs? How do I identify the author or, or publisher of this information? Can I judge the author's authority on this? Do they know about this? Should they be writing about this? And then also, how does that author support their argument? So how do they sort of um, help themselves out as they're writing all this? Synthesis is probably one of the most challenging pieces. Uh, I'm starting to look more into this. And this is construction of information across those multiple sources that we talked about before. So how do we select and construct info that we need? How do we figure out what to ignore? So a lot of synthesis is searching and sifting, but it's also ignoring different parts. But then the challenge here is, first of all, let's go to the bottom. How do I know when I have the answer? But then in the middle of that, that third bullet point, we're synthesizing across multiple modes of information. So you might say to your students, okay, I want you to read this informational book from the library. And I want you to go to Wikipedia. And I want you to read those two sources. And I want you to tell me what you've learned across those two sources. That is a challenging task. But that's also a task that, for the most part, is relatively easy because we're looking at text on for the most part white either it's either print or pixel but for the most part we're comparing text what happens when you have your learner look at a web page and a video so they could read a nonfiction book about sharks they could go to the sharks page on wikipedia and they could also watch a video about sharks now this is getting closer to the type of authentic learning that we want our students engage in and the type of learning they'll need for the future so when we think about synthesizing across these multiple sources, we're thinking about text, we're thinking about images, we're thinking about infographics, we're thinking about maps, we're thinking about how important numeracy is right now, how important it is to be able to read charts and graphs and make sense of information from charts and graphs and relate that or compare or contrast that to other information as we read online. So this is a lot of uh, graphic organizers and making sense of information and quickly gleaning information to get a better idea of what the information is trying to tell us and then what do I do with that. The last piece is communication. So the challenge with communication and a lot of this goes into writing as we'll talk about in the next module but for communication how do I select the tool that's most appropriate for my purpose for my audience so if I want to share, you know, I, I research online in my classroom and I want to take what I've learned and share it with my peer, what's the best way, the best tool, the best communication process for that purpose? Um, what do I submit? What information do I share and what do I leave out? Do I have to share every little nook and cranny that I've learned and, and uncovered as I've done my research? Or are there certain things I can leave out? But then also, how do I share everything so that I've effectively answered the question? <coughs> Excuse me. There's different tools that I use as I work online, as I think about online reading comprehension. One of the tools that I often use in the past is Digo. Digo is an excellent source where, as educators, we can bookmark and annotate uh, digital text over time. Lately, I've been starting to use Hypothesis in my own work and in classes that I teach. I think Hypothesis is a valuable tool so we can mark up and collaboratively, collectively read. I also use a lot of blogs. I've had used Blogger and EduBlogs. Recently, I've moved into WordPress and helping others use WordPress to sort of document and archive their thinking over time. Google Forms is an incredible tool. Google Forms is an opportunity to make online spreadsheets and worksheets so that we can use this to uh, quickly capture information from our learners. It's a great assessment tool. And then last but not least, one of the great tools that I use is Google Custom Search Engine. You can make a sandbox that Google will use to search from. 
So if you're working in an elementary classroom or also throughout K-12, you can use Google Custom Search Engine to create a search engine that looks just like Google, but it only searches from a couple different websites. So part of the challenge is when we think about web quests, we're giving our learners a list of five to 10 websites that they can search from. With Google Custom Search Engine, you can take those five to 10 websites, you can drop them into Google CSE, and Google will allow students to search just from those areas. So you're still having them question, you're still having them locate, they're still evaluating, they're still synth synthesizing, but they can do this in an environment that looks close to what they would normally have to use as they get involved in these web literacy practices. So why is this important? One of the reasons why is that in terms of online reading comprehension, many of the students that need this the most aren't getting it. Um, a lot of the current research shows that the, the haves are getting this and have nots. The kids that are work that are learning in Title I schools and, and at-risk environments, they're not getting a lot of these online reading comprehension or web literacy skills and practices that students in the more affluent districts are. Um, and so that's hugely problematic. This is also a challenge because, or this is something that's important because we still don't know a lot about the differences between online and offline reading. I've been studying online reading comprehension for about a decade now, and I still learn new things every day. There are things that constantly change and we constantly have to study and we have to think about, okay, what are those real connections between what's happening with those traditional print texts and, what's, and, and how do those relate to or not relate to the online sources that we have our students interact with. Last but not least, this is also important because we're thinking about real, authentic, web-based learning and authentic assessments. So if we think about teaching and learning, we often strive for authentic learning activities. Most times, if we say the internet is the dominant text of our generation, most times we're actively searching and sifting through the internet, searching and sifting using digital text and tools to make sense of what this really means for our, our students and for our own uh, inquiries, this is the sort of work that we need to fold in on a more regular basis into our classroom. So once again, we're looking at the web literacy map. We're looking at the ways that these interconnect. We've already talked about participate. We're digging into reading now. Previously, we, ex we defined reading as exploring. In this, I've taken my own expertise in online reading comprehension and tried to help us negotiate that. The web literacy work is, is also looking at reading as evaluating, synthesizing, navigating, and searching. In our work here in this video, online reading comprehension looks at questioning, locating, evaluating, synthesizing, and communicating. So the real only element that we're, we're sort of leaving out um, is the earlier version of security from the earlier version of the web lit map. Once again, I thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about online reading comprehension and this important element of web literacy. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments and hopefully this is a benefit to you.